All right, folks. Let's kick this show off. Like I said, we are going to have a pretty tight agenda today, so I'll at least get some of the formalities out of the way while I'm waiting for a few more to log in. Um, my name is Elliot Davis. I am the policy analyst here at the Houston Health Department with the HIV, STI, and Viral Hep Bureau. And I will be hosting a town hall today. Um, I'm going to come off or at least come on camera for a quick second. Uh, but we do ask that just because of our experience with Teams and some of the limitations around it, if you guys can make sure uh, you keep yourself on mute unless you are talking. Uh, and same thing, if we can keep the cameras off, that'll kind of help the bandwidth. So just as a reminder, uh, this call is informational and not intended for media purposes. Uh, if you do have any uh, media related inquiries, I put the website down here and my wonderful colleague uh, will drop that in the chat as well. And I also encourage you, uh, if you haven't already, visit our syphilis website. We've got some great resources there. We've tried to make it a, a one-stop shop. And for anyone new, uh, I always try to include these slides. I'm not going to spend much time on them because you're going to hear from uh, the leads of each of these components. But these are our six components of our um, syphilis outbreak response. And this slide, again, I'm not going to go into it, but I want anyone to have this as a reference. I will make these slides available uh, after the um, after the town hall as quick as I can uh, over email, and then this recording will be available as soon as I can get our uh, communications team to upload it to our website. Uh, but this talks about each component and what they do. But again, you're going to hear directly from those folks in just a second. And we have the amazing uh, Kelsey Catton from our surveillance team that's going to talk. Um, she's kind of the highlight of today's show. She's going to do a deeper dive into the data trends and the thresholds that have kind of guided our uh, response over the past year since we announced. Um, but I want to take a couple seconds here and provide everyone. These are our highly coveted heat maps. Um, so it shows the where the hot spots are. Uh, yellow being the most dense, um, and this is for 2024 so far. This may look, if you're familiar with the previous versions, might be a little less dense because I have just isolated it to this year. Uh, but this is overall for primary, secondary, early, and late latent syphilis. Um, and similar trends that we've seen, that bright yellow spot right in the center. Um, we've got that um, Sharpstown that southwest corridor and then up north has been another one again this looks a little less dense than it did in prior versions that included last year but we see the same thing when we a little less dense but this is male at birth um, but again that spot up north spot in the center downtown area and then sharpstown kind of southwest that changes however when we isolate it to female at birth, that pattern looks a little bit different. So instead of that hot spot at the center, we've got one a little further south. And then again, some little bit different um, concentration or um, focus, but it's still that southwest area. And then we've got the two bright spots up north. And these will also be available on our website. Uh, and so before I turn it over, I also wanted to throw it out there. Um, we have seen the sustained trends that we were hoping to see, kind of the goal we set for ourselves when we first announced this, announced this outbreak, which was we wanted several consecutive months below an established threshold. Um, so while we're waiting for our leadership to give the full approval, we have started a conversation around what would demobilization look like and what have we gleaned from these efforts that we want to continue during our regular operations? And so you're going to hear some of the team leads speak to that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Juan Gonzalez with disease investigation and public health follow up. All right, thank you, Eli. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as it's been mentioned, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the overall goal uh, was to create a response to focus on uh, the syphilis outbreak and so more specifically on early syphilis uh, cases and 
um, focusing on high priority cases, uh, which would have been uh, more like in the maternal category and labor and delivery category as well. Uh, part of our strategy has, um, as mentioned in the in the other components on the previous slides, has been to enhance our surveillance activities and increase capacity. So with that being said, uh, we currently um, we have 15 surveillance staff and 10 DIS conducting those case investigations and following up. Uh, and so we had um, um, we activated a COVID. Um, we activated a team from our COVID uh, unit to help support this initiative, uh, which helped us in uh, supporting the disease investigators. Um, and so with that, we ensured uh, accurate and daily monitoring activities uh, by managing those through manual spreadsheets. This in particular was a team effort, including um, some of the activated support staff. Uh, we also, uh, worked with our database thesis and even built out uh, the red uh, built out a system in the red cap system and and so for this in order to achieve uh, working in multiple databases and manually capturing data uh, we provided some just-in-time training and established um, some new duties as well to maintain um, um, accurate data um, on as um, on a daily basis, right? And so since the start of the uh, syphilis outbreak response to surveillance um, unit has been able to receive and respond to over 3,800 incoming reports that meet our criteria for the outbreak. And our disease investigators have been able to intervene in over 4,000 actionable field records. And so um, you can go to the next slide, Eli. Uh, and so as a result, we've been able um, to make uh, intervention right in the community. And so uh, this slide here, uh, it, it illustrates referrals from January to June, uh, which are uh, coordinated by the disease investigators. And so this, um, this goal is to provide um, infected persons with syphilis with adequate treatment um, and prophylactic treatment for those that have been exposed to syphilis. Um, so what you see here basically is in the orange, those that uh, we were able to touch base with and those clients that were referred over to a Houston Health Department Health Center and kept an appointment. In the dark blue, you'll see where some of those were no-show. Um, on the other hand, in the gray, you'll see where our staff uh, were able to touch base again with that client and reschedule them into a clinic. Um, so overall, during this time, we've uh, completed about 315 referrals. Um, and so uh, as a result of our outbreak response, we wanna be able to continue the success uh, that we have had. And so our goal to sustain and maintain our response activities, uh, some of those include exercising methods uh, to conduct the investigation. Uh, we also learned um, that uh, enhancing our motivational inter interviewing skills has been helpful, and so we want to continue that. We also want to continue internal trainings to keep staff refreshed on overcoming some of the barriers during those particular investigations. And uh, lastly, we also want to continue um, our QA processes. Um, and so we have found with the data uh, that we've been able to collect and utilize, it's been very helpful. And so with that, we're able to provide awareness internally and to providers to help um, improve some of the reporting. Um, and ultimately, um, it allows for us to help work together and uh, develop methods uh, to decrease the syphilis rates. Um, so that's um, all I have for the uh, disease investigation portion, a bit of an overview. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And next is enhanced clinical operations. And while Kaylin could not be here today, and I'll do my best to fill in for her on the next slide, uh, Dr. Lopez Belin, I believe, is on the line. I'll let her talk through this one. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, under the clinical operations, I'm going to start with the community par uh, provider partnership. Um, 
through all these entire syphilis outbreak response, we have met with more than 230 providers uh, from 67 different healthcare facilities. Uh, we have included presentations, talks, uh, provider visits, mostly for education, and also uh, we have included ground rounds to, to different uh, universities. Uh, we also uh, have reached over more than 2,000 MDs and NPs and also other clinical staff, including nurses, including medical assistants. And we have also received over 1,000 uh, calls to the provider line where we provide um, support and CDC recommendations and uh, history search for these providers uh, according to the infection. Now, uh, under the health centers and pharmacy, um, there was a streamlined clinical treatment process where um, syphilis basically was um, put onto focus. Uh, also, they implemented a daily, uh, a daily medication report and they also implemented a medication inventory uh, process. Uh, under the mobile vaccination unit and also the call center, um, they were expanding clinical operations to mobile sites, enhancing healthcare access, and also addressing barriers. And one of the other things that the uh, call center actually was doing was uh, following up patients who were prescribed uh, doxycycline at any of the city of Houston clinics to ensure they were uh, adherence, uh, getting that adherence uh, to the treatment. And that's pretty much it on their clinical operations. If you have any questions, that will be all. Thank you. Jeanette, thank you so much. Um, and so I wanted to provide this next one. Um, usually Kaylin touches a little bit more on this, but just so you guys have the data and get a kind of a visual of uh, the treatments administered so far from our clinics. That light blue you see on top is the doxy and then uh, bicillin first, second, and third dose are in the orange, dark blue, and gray, respectively. So that's the last little over 30 days reported. And with that, Ms. Guadalupe, I will turn it over to you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so the SOR's outreach screening and education has as you guys know, worked to expand screening and education activities in those high impact areas. Um, and we have proudly touched over 6,000 persons. That includes, uh, you know, by either testing, um, providing education, um, transporting them to treatment services, uh, participating in, in events and activities, uh, to provide awareness around the outbreak response, um, as well as symptoms, just overall education. Uh, always continuing our endemic approach. Um, so worked very, have been working very closely with vaccine services as well. Um, and so we, as we move forward, we have been conducting an analysis of, of our response efforts to identify which activities we will continue to, to sustain. Um, and so some of what's being considered is the impact and uh, outcomes of all of our activities. We've uh, assessed our resource availability as well as um, our, our organization's capacity. Um, we've looked at our alignment across the different department areas that we work with and collaborate with in order to bring this event to fruition and be able to serve as many individuals as possible. Um, and we are also considering uh, the sustainability and um, the long term. Uh, and so we will continue to work um, with our public health follow-up teams to identify those um, primary and secondary cases to conduct uh, uh, screening events um, that are linked to these cases. Uh, we will continue to take requests from um, community partners. Uh, we will continue to attend and bring education service, education um, to events that are highly attended by our priority populations. Um, and so that's where we are right now. If there's any questions, I will gladly address them. 
And this just gives you, um, allows you to see uh, the events, the services that we bring out to community. So some of them, again, depending on the event, uh, there's education only, there's education and testing, um, educa ed education, testing and vaccine services. But what we've also been doing is we've been bringing along our service linkage team um, in the event that we have a reactor for um, HIV to begin that process. And the test that we conduct is always bundled testing. So we do syphilis, HIV, hepatitis. Um, and whenever there's an organization that has the capacity to conduct chlamydia and gonorrhea in non-traditional settings, um, we offer those as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Guadalupe. And that brings me to uh, the portion that I've been in charge of. Um, so in a perfect world, we'd have limitless resources, or at least enough to be more than just a safety net. Uh, but the fact remains, we do operate within limitations. And while we try to be as strategic, efficient, uh, informed, and innovative as possible, we're only successful in this uh, in partnership with the community. And that's true of, of all the components you just heard from, but for my role, it's essentially my singular focus, uh, and that's namely identifying and connecting with community partners uh, and facilitating resource sharing and maximization. So um, <laughs> second to only the bicillin shortage, uh, one of the most precious resources has been education and awareness uh, in the mobilization activity. And so what my focus was was really getting that organizational um, education through either individual presentations to key community stakeholders uh, so they could kind of pass along that information to their community or uh, through larger networking forums such as these. And we've gotten uh, very positive feedback about the town hall. So this is something we are planning to do, planning to continue indefinitely, uh, but kind of zooming out to more of a HIV, STI, and, and viral hep focus in general. And with that, I'm going to turn it over very briefly to my colleague, Michelle Carr, um, who's a staff analyst on my team, and she's going to talk a little bit about what we do to protect the data before um, the star of the show, uh, Ms. Kelsey, will go into uh, what those data trends look like and the threshold analysis. Michelle? Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Carr. I'm a staff analyst in the Policy and Evaluation Unit, and I'm here to talk a little bit about security and confidentiality. Uh, the Houston Health Department takes security and confidentiality very seriously, and all staff, uh, all health department staff, regardless if they work with confidential information or not are required to be trained in security and confidentiality. It's important that all staff are trained in security and confidentiality because regardless of their job duties, they may come across it um, directly or indirectly. They may overhear conversations. Mail could be potentially misdelivered um, in the event of an adverse event, such as a hurricane, um, and we have to set up shelters or cooling centers. Um, we may have staff doing um, public health interventions that might not normally work with confidential information. And then also we have maintenance and custodial staff in our offices that need to be trained in case they come across confidential information during the course of their activities. Next slide, please. And so there are certain requirements that are required by law. Um, HIPAA is cons what we consider to be our baseline. This is the requirements of federal law. And then because uh, a lot of our programs are grant funded, we are also held to the requirements of those grants, whether they come from the CDC or the state. And then also the health department ourselves, we have our own policies and standards in place. and. Um, HIPAA, like I said, we consider that to be the baseline. The state or other grant funded requirements can often be a little bit more stringent. And then in certain cases, the health department has requirements that um, often exceed these requirements um, by the other uh, organizations. 
Next slide, please. And so we work under what we call the minimum necessary standard, and this just means that um, health department employees are only able to access the minimum amount of confidential information that is required in order for them to perform their job activities. So not every um, health department employee has access to data systems or network drives or um, other confidential information, and it's based solely upon their ability to do their job. We also require all staff to understand and sign off that they acknowledge that it is never acceptable to access information um, purely out of curiosity. Um, and again, it's only um, directly required to their job activities. Next slide, please. And so there's three key safe safeguards that are required to ensure the confidentiality of information. Um, these are administrative safeguards. These include things like policies, procedures, um, trainings, um, appointing, um, say, a HIPAA privacy officer. Um, but all of those are considered to be administrative. Um, then we have physical safeguards, which these are things like locking doors, locking file cabinets. Um, if paper documents need to be taken into the field, they're required to be stored in a locked case. And then the final safeguard is the technical safeguards, and this refers to the technology that we have in place to protect confidential information, and this could be um, log requiring a password to log into a, a secure data system and then having controls in place like um, the user being locked out after three failed password attempts next slide and so these are just a few of the measures that we take to ensure compliance around security and confidentiality. And we start at the very beginning of the hiring process. Um, we have interview questions that are geared towards um, asking about the applicant's knowledge around security and confidentiality. And then there are other um, tools and procedures, policies, guidance that we have in place, some which reside um, internally in our um, iPassport system, which is responsible for our SOP and policies management system. And a lot of these things are required that the staff either has to um, annually review and sign off on or biannually. And then we also conduct annual review of all HIPAA security and confidentiality procedures, as well as our information privacy security and confidentiality manual. Um, and we do these because technology changes and so and therefore um, the threats also change. So we have to be um, aware of where these threats might be coming from. This slide here um, addresses some of the guidance or policies and SOPs that we have in place. Um, we have IT policies. Um, we have uh, social media policies, visitor access policies. And then, you know, there's a list here that you can all review later. Next slide, please. And then we also have what is called a security and confidentiality subcommittee. This subcommittee is part of our quality council. And so we have stakeholders embedded throughout all of the programs in the Houston Health Department. Um, and they kind of work together to facilitate the standardization of security and confidentiality procedures, making sure that we have a common message throughout the health department. We also work with the different departments or bureaus and accept comments, concerns, feedback on security and confidentiality issues that have been identified. And then we can provide recommendations to those areas and request for resolution from the Quality Council. 
Next slide. And I was going to say, I think actually, I think that's that one, it. Yep. I think yep. you're off the hook. And so if anybody ever has any questions about security and confidentiality, they can always reach out to me, um, Michelle Carr, michelle.carr at houstontx.gov. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And not that everybody up until this point isn't a star, but the, the star of the show, the focus of today's meeting, I'm going to turn it over now to Ms. Kelsey Catton from our surveillance team. Hi, can, can you hear me okay, Elliot? Yes, I can, loud and clear. Okay. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, as Elliot says, my name is uh, Kelsey Caton, and I work for the data services section in the Houston Health Department. And as mentioned, I will be going over some of our current syphilis trends today for the Houston area, as well as an overview of uh, the early syphilis threshold matrix that I'll explain a little bit later in this presentation. Next slide. Um, so first I'll go over our local syphilis trends. Uh, we'll look at trend, annual trends for syphilis by clinical stage and some selected demographics, including sex at birth, age group, and uh, race ethnicity group. For each of these, um, we will see the annual trends from 2017 to 2023. Um, some of these figures we'll go over will include um, sort of a rate variable, which is when we normalize the annual case counts by the estimated population size for you know, each specific group of interest. Um, so sort of later on, I'll go briefly go over a surveillance tracking tool we developed last year that has assisted Houston Health Department in monitoring current early syphilis levels on a monthly basis. So just wanna go over a couple notes on the data and really just to say that our main data source is um, from thesis, I think it was mentioned earlier, and so any syphilis case that was assigned to HHG jurisdiction with the patient residing in the Houston Harris County area is included in the analysis you will see. And then for the annual trends, the time frame we're looking at again is from 2017 to 2023, where, and then we're adding some 2024 data, um, which is still provisional when we go over uh, the threshold matrix later on. And then everything today was as of August 1st of this year. Okay, next slide. So to start off, uh, this figure here displays the annual syphilis case count by clinical stage group being for our Houston Harris County area. So the, that pink magenta line is our early syphilis case count from 2017 to 2023. And that, that aggregates our primary, secondary, and early latent cases. Uh, the blue line you see is our late latent case count through those years. So as you can see, both of the groups um, are pretty consistently increasing from 2017 forward. On this figure and sort of on the next figures as well, you'll see simple regression lines, linear regression lines included with corresponding regression equations um, for each group that's presented just to give an estimated rate of increase of syphilis through time. So for this particular figure, we can see that in our area, area we've um, gained about 386 cases a year in early syphilis since 2017, um, comparing that to about 183 gain a year in late latent syphilis cases per year. So we are gaining more early syphilis cases than we are late latent, but both are still increasing through time. Next slide. To break down that early syphilis case line a little bit more, this figure now sort of breaks out the primary, secondary, and early latent cases separately. Um, we can see that most of our early cases are early latent. So that sort of turquoise teal line just, you know, we has a higher case count than um, the other two. Um, and then following that would be secondary and then primary. 
We also see from that regression equation that we're gaining more early latent cases on an annual basis compared to the other two stages with, and we get about 232 early latent cases a year since 2017. Um, however, you know, we're still seeing an increase in, you know, the primary and secondary cases. Um, another thing I would like to note, while overall we are seeing an increase in early latent cases from 2017, we actually have a pretty stable um, case number for the last three years. Uh, that is from 2021 to 2023, where we're averaging about 1,900, 1,950 cases a year. Um, and I just would like to point out that's um, not something that's mirrored in those other two primary and secondary lines. So those, those have continued to increase the last three years. Next slide. So uh, again, this is further zooming in, you know, cause the scale just a uh, uh, finer scale for the primary and secondary um, syphilis case count. Um, again, we consistently have more secondary cases to primary cases, and we also see a more rapid increase in secondary cases, about gaining about 100 cases per year compared to about 53, 54 cases in um, primary cases, that is. And now I will go through some demographic trends. Specifically, this is all for early syphilis. So again, we're aggregating primary, secondary, and early latent cases together in these lines. Um, so these two figures break down our early syphilis case counts through time by sex at birth. Um, the male uh, is that teal line and the female is sort of that pink magenta line in both of these figures. So the left figure shows just sort of that raw case count, um, annual case count. And on the right, we sort of see that case count normalized by uh, estimated population size. That's what we're calling sort of case rate per year. Um, so again, because our population is split pretty 50-50 male to female, these figures mirror each other pretty well. Um, but as we can see, a majority of our cases through time have been male, and they, we gain about 275, 76 cases a year, male early syphilis cases a year. So again, while we do see that this rate is, uh, or that there are about two and a half times more cases of male cases there are, than there are to female cases, uh, again, just like to emphasize that we are seeing an increase in our uh, early syphilis cases in females. Next slide. So here are similar figures, but instead we're breaking down by uh, selected age groups. So there's four age group categories, um, 15 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, and 45 and up. Um, so again, we have sort of the raw case counts through time on the left with the uh, cases per 10,000 population on the right. So we can see that the 25 to 34 year age group has the highest case count through time. And then again, if you look to the right, it also has the highest case rate per population. And then if it also has the highest rate of increase um, in both on both sides of this. So then we kind of see that the second highest case count and rates sort of dances between the adjacent age groups. So that 25 to 34 being the 15 to 24 and the 35 to 44 year old age groups. And then you can see that the uh, lowest early syphilis case count is seen in the 45 plus age group. And again, you may notice also that from 2022 to 2023, we actually see this group, um, the case count and rate uh, flattening out, or there's even, you might see like a slight decline in the line, which is not necessarily seen in the other age groups. So that 45 plus age group was the only age group here that we actually had a, a steadying or even a slight decline um, from year to year here. Next slide. 
So moving on to look at these, our early syphilis cases by race ethnicity group. Um, for these figures, we've grouped race ethnicity into four sort of major categories, Hispanic, non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white, and non-Hispanic other. So non-Hispanic other um, aggregates sort of all those other race groups that's not listed in the other three. Um, on the left, you see the annual case counts once again, with the non-Hispanic Black group having the most cases on an annual basis, um, followed by Hispanic, the Hispanic group. On the right, you see the rates by population again, and again, you can see that the non-Hispanic Black group has the highest case count per population and also has the highest rate of increase which is about 2.7 times that in the Hispanic group. So kind of the next line, um, uh, high line in that figure. And it's about 4.6 times that of the non-Hispanic white group. So the not, and just another note about the non-Hispanic white group. Again, it's, as you can see, it's increasing overall since 2017. Um, however, it's the only race in the city group here that we actually saw a slight decline from 22, 2022 to 2023. Next slide. So shifting slightly from looking at those annual trends and looking at a more of a breakdown, a demographic breakdown, uh, taking the 2020-17 to 2023 cohort as a whole for early syphilis. Um, this is this panel figure here displays the age group distribution of cases by race ethnicity group. So you see the labels here for each bar display the case count for each sort of combination of race, ethnicity, and age, uh, along with the percentage of the total case count um, listed. So we can see that across you know, race ethnicity groups, the highest proportion of our early syphilis cases, which is, ends up being about 20% of our cases, um, is our non-Hispanic Black ages 25 to 34, followed by Hispanic, our Hispanic group with the same age, you know, that same age range, um, which make about 14% of those early syphilis cases. Again, to just note a couple other things in this figure, you do see slight variation in the age group distributions across these race ethnicity groups. So if you look at non-Hispanic black, um, non-Hispanic black figure in the top right, the cases actually kind of skew slightly younger with uh, the second um, age group with second highest proportion age group being the 15 to 24 year old age group. Um, conversely, if you look sort of at the bottom left figure, which displays the age distribution for a non-Hispanic white group, the cases actually skew slightly older with the highest proportion of cases being in the 45 plus group. Next slide. So to kind of, again, focus on those race ethnicity groups that we, we do see the most early syphilis cases in. That is, again, the non-Hispanic Black and Hispanic group. Um, we're now looking at these age group distributions um, separated uh, by another variable, the sex at birth variable. So on the left, we see the age group distributions for Hispanic at the top and non-Hispanic Black groups at the bottom for the male um, cohort, cohort of our male early syphilis cases. And then on the right side, similarly, we see this, but just for the, our, uh, the cohort of female early syphilis cases. So when you're looking at our male cases, our, um, for both male Hispanic and non-Hispanic black cases, that again, that 25 to 34 year old uh, age group has the highest proportion of um, our syphilis cases. But then again, if you sort of flip over to the females, you see something slightly different where the highest proportion of our 
early cases here actually is seen in the younger age group um, for non-Hispanic Black, followed by the second youngest age group for non-Hispanic Black. So again, when we sort of, you know, further break down this data demographically, we kind of start seeing different distributions um, depending on the combination of demographic variables you're using. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I guess to wrap up this section, um, I'll try to summarize a few key points from the previous slides. So again, syphilis in the Houston-Harris County area has been increasing since at least 2017. You see these increases uh, pretty much generally, though there are you know, some groups that differ uh, across clinical syphilis stage, sex, and again, most race, ethnicity, and age groups. A majority of our early syphilis cases are male who also have the highest case rate per estimated population size. However, again, just to point out, we are seeing increases in, in syphilis uh, throughout the years for females as well. Uh, overall, we see the highest rates and greatest increases in rates in our non-Hispanic Black group as far as race ethnicity groups, and then 25 to 34 year olds as far as age groups. And a majority of our syphilis cases uh, for these years were um, non-Hispanic Blacks ages 25 to 34, followed by Hispanics ages 25 to 34. And uh, next slide. And next slide. So uh, I'll try to be brief, moving on to, um, uh, talking about our early syphilis threshold matrix. So last year, I believe around July, August of uh, 2023, uh, we developed a tool for uh, you know Houston Health Department and our SOR team to assist in their monitoring of syphilis levels in our area. So what we did is we implemented implemented sort of a you know, basic established procedure of comparing, you know, current values to a historical baseline. So we looked back through time to determine a relatively stable period in our data where we're not necessarily seeing a significant increase or a significant decrease in our monthly syph early syphilis counts. From there, we calculated um, the mean or average and standard deviation of this baseline period. And then what we do is on a monthly basis, we compare whatever our current value is to that baseline mean. And we try to, and we calculate how many standard deviations that current value is falls away from that baseline mean. So, so moving on, depending on how many, oh, sorry, back, go back. Up too soon. Um, depending on the number of standard deviations uh, we were away from that mean for our current value, that kind of determined, quote, what our like level of concern is. Specifically, if we were less than one standard deviation above our historical mean, uh, we considered it to be sort of a low level of concern. Um, one to two standard deviations above that mean, we sort of raise it to a medium level of concern. And then if we are more than two standard deviations above that calculated mean, uh, we said the level of concern was high. Um, and th these are color coded to green, yellow, and red. Um, so we initially used uh, 2019 as our baseline period which was our last year before COVID, where we had, you know, full set of data and with the hopes of trying to push our early syphilis numbers, you know, to pre-COVID values. However, kind of a, a few months into this and a few months into 2024, we shifted that baseline period to 2023. As I think, as Elliot mentioned, um, we didn't really see a further increase in 2023. It seemed to like we like reached a ceiling or steady, um, steady values in 2023. So we're, that became like our ceiling um, for early syphilis levels. Okay, next slide. 
So here we display the early syphilis threshold matrix, an example or an example of it. Um, this was updated again, August 1st of this year. Uh, we have sort of our indicators listed on the left of the table and um, which we look at early syphilis count as a whole. And then we look at separately some key demographics. So each, each cutoffs that you see in the next three columns here um, that are the cutoffs for our low, medium, and the high concerns are, are tailored to those individual demographic groups. And then, you, then you, if you move sort of further in the table, you see our current value and then our previously reported value. And again, we update this on a monthly basis. Um, so, and then we, to mention again, we, we color code, so green, yellow, and red for low, medium, and high. The bottom table on the right is just, again, another little uh, tracking tool that we can just track these colors through time. So as you can see from May 2024 forward, all indicators um, have been considered low, uh, or concern level is low. Um, for each month based off our 2023 baseline. I would like to make a brief note on the data log as you might see that it says current value April 2024, but this was updated on August 1st. Um, from the report dates, the date of the poll for this um, data, there is an estimated two to three month lag in reported cases to our main data source for this. So therefore our current value is actually the count for three months prior to the report poll date. So um, another way like our May through July syphilis counts, we just don't feel like are really real or uh, complete numbers yet. So that's why there's some date, just, you know, different dates you might not expect showing here in this table. Okay, next slide. Um, to visually look at um, this another way, this is a time series that shows the monthly early syphilis count from January 2022 forward, along with the color coding of the ranges of the number of standard deviations above the baseline mean that was calculated for 2023. Um, to make a note that we actually have one more distinguishment here. Um, in that orange, which indicates the two to three standard deviations range, which is different from sort of the previous slide where we only had three colors, um, with the red representing uh, that the, uh, the three plus standard deviation range. Um, so as you can see, there is a peak in August of 2023. That was sort of our highest value. Um, historically and for 2023, um, but that also coincides with sort of the SOR team's mass concerted effort to test and uh, treat and educate uh, Houston on syphilis. Um, and then from there, you start to see a decline in the monthly values with sort of that re-up in January of this year. And then the, the black line you see turns into sort of a dotted line just to represent sort of that data lag time period where those, the numbers there are presented there are considered to be incomplete. So also you can see that our most recent values are well below the 2023 mean. So we're all in green for the last few months. Next slide. So Additionally, we developed sort of a secondary indicator indicators to help monitor early syphilis in the form of just tracking simple linear three, six, nine, and 12 month trends on a monthly basis. So this table just gives sort of a snapshot of that um, where you see the slope and corresponding P values for each trend for um, those time frames. And then it, uh, an indicator of whether this, uh, these trends were significantly increasing, which 
we've color coded red, uh, flat, or there's not really a trend. So the no significance increase or decreasing. So that would be the yellow, color coded yellow. And then if we see something that's significantly decreasing, we color code that green. Um, so again, we track these trends through time. So as you can see, the last couple of months our nine to 12 month trends as of these report dates were actually significantly decreasing. Well, that's it. <laughs> so yeah, so those, so just to wrap up, those are just a few of the metrics. I mean, there's lots of things that SR team is monitoring. Um, but these are a few of the like specific metrics we've been monitoring the past year or so. So that is all I have today. So thank you for your time. And Kelsey, thank you so very much for everything you've done to inform our efforts. Um, and especially asking you to condense the, the last year into 20 minutes. That was quite a feat. Um, <laughs> I do want to pause it right there for just a second to see if we have any questions uh, for you. Uh, I know we've got one from um, Donna in the chat. I think that's probably going to be one. I'm wondering if um, Juan could answer. And I know Kaylin might be able to speak to that too, but she's unfortunately not here. So I can get back to you from the clinical side. Juan, I don't know if you can speak to um, any uh, uh, c consistent themes that we've seen from uh, primary cases, like lack of concern or use of STI barriers. Uh, sure. So, I mean, overall, I will say that in in general, what we have noticed is that uh, with early syphilis, um, due to the fact that these uh, individuals are experiencing signs and symptoms, um, they are more inclined to um, to work with an investigator because they are. They, they're experiencing something right on their body. And so uh, we definitely see where uh, we are more successful uh, or at least um, we've had to work harder for those that do not have signs or symptoms. Um, and so as far as like some of the barriers uh, that that might be one of them is where um, if me as an individual that tested positive for syphilis doesn't have signs or symptoms, um, I might not be as uh, concerned if everything looks fine, right? But my blood work says otherwise. Uh, so some of the barriers is definitely education, uh, which we've mentioned. So it's been a big um, help um, to educate providers um, on on and just providing them awareness on uh, some of the stats for syphilis and um, just kind of going over their screening process. Um, uh, internally, we've been exercising some of our methods to uh, in investigations like conducting record searches and being persistent um, and kind of um, looking at uh, some of those investigations that have been closed um, and taking a closer look to see if there's a way to turn around uh, that particular outcome. Um, and so our supervisors and some of our subject matter experts have stepped in uh, to kind of help turn around some of those investigations um, by uh, trying different methods um, and and you know that has been successful um, also just kind of looking at our data and seeing uh, what's been working and you know who's uh, being able to track the different components um, that are used to conduct the investigations and looking at uh, where we're doing better um, in some areas we've been able to use like a peer to peer type of training, uh, which kind of helps us as well um, overcome some of those barriers. So hopefully that answers uh, some of your question, um, but that's kind of like what we've seen around like the early cases of syphilis. Thank you, sir. Any other questions before I turn it over? We have two kind of bonus updates, but I want to see especially where Kelsey's concerned. She did such a wonderful job explaining it, but I know it's a lot of information. And if not, we'll have more time at the end too. But with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Kirsten Short for a quick MPOX and meningitis update.
Thanks, Elliot. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kirsten Short. I'm the Chief of Epidemiology here at the Houston Health Department. Um, and thanks to the SOR team for giving me some time and space to, to speak to you all. Um, I've been on a couple times to talk about MPOC, so I just want to give a couple quick updates. We're not going to go through any of the background, um, except just a reminder that there are two different clades of MPOCs, a clade one and a clade two. And so what I first want to start with is the clade one MPOX outbreak that's been ongoing in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's been ongoing really since 2023. Uh, they've reported uh, since that time, they've reported over 22,000 suspect MPOX cases and more than 1,200 deaths. This is compared to previous years. MPOX clade one is endemic in DRC. But in, you know, prior years, they're seeing closer to about 3,500, a little bit more than that average cases in a year. So this is really a significant increase. And I think the last time I was on here, one of the things we highlighted was that uh, Clade 1 has also relatively recently uh, been identified as being transmissible uh, through sexual contact, in addition to close contact, uh, contact with animals and some of the other traditional manners. Why I'm bringing this up again uh, is because CDC recently issued a HAN or a health alert notice in response to the detection of clade one MPOX in non endemic countries. And so if you look at this map on here, we've got DRC, uh, Republic of the Congo, and the Central African Republic. So these are countries where clade one is endemic, and DRC, sort of the biggest country on this map, is where this ongoing outbreak is happening. These countries in red over on the eastern border of DRC, so Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, um, have had clade one MPOX detected. The reason this is a little bit concerning is because these are countries where clade one MPOX is not endemic. So contact tracing and investigation, case investigation is ongoing right now. Many of these cases have been tied back to travel to the DRC uh, or contact with somebody who had traveled to the DRC, but it does look like it is uh, crossing some of those borders a little bit into countries that don't routinely deal with this um, infection or disease. So that's why we wanted uh, folks to be aware of this when they're looking at folks um, and assessing for uh, MPOX and whether or not it may be a clade one MPOX case or not. So far, there have been no cases of clade one MPOX in the United States. Uh, the risk remains low to very low uh, for the United States at this point. Um, the WHO is going through and redoing its risk assessment, uh, and when they do that, they do assessments sort of at the country, at the regional level, at the continental level, essentially, and then at the global level. We expect that the risk uh, to the U.S. Um, and, and sort of the global level will remain very low, but the country-to-country -country transmission within uh, the African continent, that risk assessment may go up a little bit. Uh, next slide. So now I want to talk a little bit about clade 2 MPOX. This is the uh, clade that has caused this global outbreak that has spilled over into uh, Europe and the Americas. And again, most cases identified among MSM, contact sexual transmission, uh, and it began with international travel. And so um, over on the left, I've got sort of the global U.S. and Houston numbers for sort of the peak of the outbreak 2022-2023. Um, those numbers went down dramatically. Um, the CDC stopped reporting sort of overall numbers um, after the end of 2023 um, or middle of 2023. And so we had a few small cases. We went months without cases. We had a few small cases pop up November through February. Uh, and then we went another short period without, and we've had since April of 2024, we've had another 24 cases. Um, so we're seeing sort of these little blips or little sort of surges um, of case transmission. And so we do want to make sure that it continues to stay on everybody's radar. Next slide. So what I've got here, just to give you an idea, this top slide um, is looking at MPOX cases per week in Houston um, from the start of this year, so across 2024. The bottom graph down here is the number of MPOX cases reported per day at the national level. 
Um, and then that yellow line on that bottom slide is the seven day rolling average. So this is uh, going from January 24 um, through basically the uh, end of July, beginning of August. And so you can see what we had. We had in the beginning this our our small sort of surge that had started actually in late 2023 through 2024, a long period without any cases. And then we've had another sort of surge um, that we're still going through right now, although we do think that it's uh, going down. And concurrent, what you can see across the United States is that there's been sort of this low level of transmission. Uh, that was going on through much of 2024. And then we started to see that tapering off. And when you, you are able to look into the numbers, what you're seeing is what's going on here, where overall that that transmission is very low, but you see sort of these sustained train chain, excuse me, sustained chains of transmission in local communities. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, so since 2024, we've had 28 cases. Again, we're seeing it in the population uh, that we have sort of historically been seeing it in. So the majority of those are male. We're seeing it in adult males, age range 25 to 60. Uh, we're seeing it in our primarily in uh, folks who are Black or Hispanic. Next slide. Uh, one of the things I do really want to highlight here, again, is looking at our 28 cases in 2024. Um, if you look at those cases, none of them were fully vaccinated. Uh, only two of them were partially vaccinated, meaning they had received at least one dose of Chineos prior to illness onset. Um, and 22 of those, or nearly 80%, were able to confirm were not vaccinated. So when we're seeing illness, we are still predominantly seeing it in an unvaccinated population. We also had a couple where we weren't able to confirm vaccination status, uh, and we had a couple that were reported recently, so they're in an ongoing investigation. And this is really just to reinforce uh, that we want to continue to promote MPOX vaccination. That's going to protect as many people as possible for MPOX. And the higher the vaccine coverage we have in our community, the lower the chance of an outbreak and ongoing transmission. Next slide. And so that's to the end of my MPOX update. I'm going to shift gears and talk about something we haven't talked about on this uh, before, which might be a little bit outside of sort of the daily activity of some of the folks on this call. And this is meningi meningococcal meningitis prophy update. Uh, so meningococcal meningitis, it's a bacteria and it, uh, Neisseria meningitis is a bacteria that causes a disease. It's caused this inflammation of the meninges, um, which is around your brain. Uh, and it can be quite serious. So when cases of meningococcal meningitis are reported to a health department, one of the things that we do and try to do really rapidly is do um, an investigation to look for those close contacts and make sure that people who are close contacts receive prophylaxis uh, to prevent them from developing illness. Uh, traditionally, uh, the prophylaxis that's been provided, whether it's through the health department or through their uh, physician provider, is uh, Cipro. Over the last several years, um, meningococcal isolates uh, have been detected that are resistant either to Cipro uh, or to penicillin or some to both. And so one of the things that we in public health have been doing is trying to make sure that any clinical isolates that are obtained by a provider are submitted to public health laboratories. And then there's some work that's done at the public health laboratories um, and then they are, it's additionally sent on to CDC uh, to look for resistance. So um, in this summer of 2024, uh, we did get an alert uh, that we had isolates that are resistant to Cipro. That means that we need to change our strategy uh, for providing prophylaxis to prevent those additional infections in people who had close contact uh, with folks that were ill. So we've put out a health alert notice on July 31st. Uh, several of our departments came together. And what we are advising is that um, if you have close contacts of someone, you do not want to use Cipro for prophylaxis of close contacts. Your alternate close contact medications are revampin, azithromycin, or cefotrexone. And we will be maintaining this change for at least two years. While we're doing that, we're going to continue to be collecting those isolates and have them submitted uh, for testing so we can see, are we continuing to see the, this presence of uh, resistant isolates? 
or is there um is that going away and so in two years you know this guidance will be reassessed to see if we need to stay on this strategy or if we can continue to bring cipro back into um our arsenal of toolbox for prevention right now we have not seen any penicillin resistant isolates uh, so there is doesn't need to be a concurrent change in the treatment um, so this is again just for close contacts and next slide i think is my question slide elliot so you were correct that's it for me i'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any And Kirsten, we very much appreciate it. But yes, if there are any questions, feel free to come off mute or raise your hand or drop it in the chat. And we do have one more bonus update, a special appearance by Dr. Osaro Mberry. He's gonna talk a little bit about the amazing work he's doing here with the medical monitoring project. But questions for Kirsten going once. Going twice. All right. Thank you again, Kirsten. We like to use this opportunity to get any of those important updates out that we can. Um, but with that, I've got the pleasure of introducing Dr. Osaro. He is a manager with the Bureau of Epidemiology and the project coordinator for the Medical Monitoring Project, or MMP as the cool kids call it. Uh, and this is actually part of a larger effort uh, that he's leading, which is the Behavioral and Clinical Surveillance Program. Uh, but he's going to talk about his uh, his MMP, and it's an ongoing national HIV project that collects data and provides information about behaviors, clinical outcomes, uh, quality of care, barriers to care, and viral suppression amongst those diagnosed with HIV in the U.S. And on that note, Dr. Osaro, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Elliot, and thank you for the introduction, too. Uh, it's nice. This is my first time joining this meeting, and uh, I think we'll be missing it. We need to be on this meeting by my own thinking. Yeah, so uh, I'm just between your uh, late launch, so I'm going to be very brief and straightforward, and I will try next slide. In it. OK, so uh, MMP has been an ongoing, uh, an ongoing project for almost getting to this is about the 20th year. And in terms of origin, it was born out of the limitations of uh, previous uh, supplemental surveillance uh, activities that have been taking place as a way of trying to understand and characterize the HIV epidemic in the 90s. And part of it stemmed from the fact that uh, projects such as adult adolescent spectrum of HIV disease, popularly called ASD, and the SHARS, which was also supplement to HIV surveillance, they were not able to achieve the goal that CDC had taught at the time. And this was simply because there was no uh, link between data that were collected and the actual behavioral survey that uh, they were all almost independently done. And so MMP takes that advantage of having both of them as uh, part of the study. And again, there was limitation in the participating site. There were only a few sites that participated but with MMP, we have a much larger site that are participating. So that makes it different. And uh, again, MMP is much more locally and nationally represented. So the population, it's much more representation of the whole population of people with HIV in the US and locally here in the Houston Harris County. And also there was need for information about behavior, clinical outcome, quality of care, barriers to care and viral load suppression, which at the time, Everybody was trying to encourage everybody getting suppressed virally. So MMP came in between to be the basis for evaluating such a viral load suppression in the population. Next slide. So what is MMP? Uh, MMP is a special HIV surveillance project designed to learn more about experiences and need of people with HIV. And like I mentioned earlier on, it's a, it's a, there are 23 funded sites comprising of a, both states and six cities. And the six cities are LA, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, and Houston and Philadelphia. And so we are the only standalone site outside. The rest of the sites are state-funded sites. 
Next slide. So key question answered by MMP. So some of the key questions that MMP answers are how many people living with HIV are receiving medical care for HIV? How easy is it to access medical care prevention and support services? Also, what are the met and unmet needs of people living with HIV? How is treatment affecting people living with HIV? And many other questions that can be answered by MMP. Next slide. So what's the significance of MMP? MMP provides a representative and accurate data estimate, being that even though we have a sample of 400, that 400 represent in, the, in our own case here in Houston, about 25,000 people that are uh, affected by this disease. And again, MMP provides information about the behavior, medical care, and health status of uh, people with HIV, more or less monitoring the activities that have been going on within this population. Uh, again, in terms of data use, MMP data has have been used several in the healthy people 20, 20, 20, 30, and then the federal agencies, more or less CDC and HOSA and every other agency that uh, has to do with the HIV uses MMP data for some of their indicators. And again, Runwide in particular also uses HIV for their own uh, care needs and unmet needs and so on. And then prevention planning group, policy leaders, healthcare, and again, the HIV community, they are more or less uses MMP data because it seems to be the standard now that uh, it's much more reliable since it's collected over the years. And it's a combination of both the behavioral aspect of it and the clinical aspect. So in other words, it, it guides policy and funding decision aimed at increasing engagement in care. Uh, most of recent, the CDC always use MMP data to decide what area to focus uh, funding, where they can reallocate funding to, and and that will keep coming because uh, there are more discoveries as we move along. Next slide. So who participated in MMP? So when MMP started in 2005, participation was mainly uh, among people that receive medical care from the facility. So we had to get a list of uh, people that each facility uh, saw between January and April 30th. And that was not really sustainable. And it was difficult because some folks were not uh, part of that since they were not in care. People like uh, homeless, people that are incarcerated and several others that are particularly not in care. So beginning from 2015, there was a change in methodology. And the change in methodology just ended up dropping the facilities that we were counting on. So we now have to use our in-house in uh, EHAS data system to do the sampling. As you all know, every person that is infected with HIV is reported to, to us gets into EHAS. And so it's more or less the basis for MMP moving forward from 2015. And again, you have to be 18 years and older, be diagnosed uh, with HIV in the United States. And, and including in out of care. So in this case, because they are already in the HIAS system, so whether they are out of care or not, we have to find a way to locate them. That is where the HIV, I mean, the MMP changed 2015 that we now have to get involved with uh, locating people and trying to get them into care too, as part of MMP. Next slide. So what's our process? Uh, of course, our process starts from sampling. Uh, we the study, I mean, the survey involved two stage sampling methodology that is applied. The first stage, of course, is the state. For inclusion in MP. And out of these 50 states, 23 were sampled based on their, based on the prevalence of HIV in those states and cities. And that's how we came about the 23 that now represent the United States as uh, in the survey. Second stage was person level, which means that for each site, a sample of 400 people with HIV from each project area is selected each year from the National HIV Surveillance System, which is the EHAS. Again, some city, because of the population, they have more. New York have about uh, 800, and I, I think LA also have 800 person sample. But here in, this, here in the state of Texas, there are two sites Houston is a standalone site, and the sample for Houston is 400, and the state, the rest of the cities and counties is handled by the state MMP. 
So they also get a sample of 400. So in other words, within the state of Texas, we have 400 samples. Next slide. In terms of data collection, of course, we do have uh, interview structured questionnaires and it's, uh, and then we use the system in it, a kind of internet based electronics instrument called Voxco. Uh, this is a, it's a software that was developed by ICF International. And then we also have this, this structured questionnaire in two forms, both English and Spanish. And the administration of this questionnaire is either by phone or in person. It takes about 45 to 60 minutes to administer the questionnaire. And at the end, we do have a token of appreciation of $75 visa gift card that is issued to people that uh, participate in the, in the survey for their time. Uh, in terms of medical record abstraction, we go all the way back two years prior to the interview date. So if you are interviewed today, then we go back two years and then we request for your medical uh, record and then we conduct a medical record abstraction for that two years of all the diagnosis and any other treatment that you've received over the years for those, within those two years. And again, this is entered directly into the Voxco internet-based electronic health record system. Next slide. So what are the key areas covered by MMP? MMP covers, I think I would say MMP is the most comprehensive study there is as far as HIV is concerned, uh, I should say in the world, because uh, there's so many, almost all the aspects are very well covered. And right now we've been trying to reduce some of the questionnaire because some of the aspects were not really being responded to. But so far in general, this is in, this is these are the topical area that we do have. We have the general medical care, the HIV treatment and adherent, we have HIV care. And within each of these subheaders, there's a lot of questions within the most being from sexual behavior. And we also have emotional support, stigma and discrimination, transmission of age, transmission risk behaviors, alcohol, smoking, uh, prevention activities, gynecological and reproductive history, violence, all forms of violence, depression, anxiety, disability, met and unmet need. And then finances is about uh, source of finance, uh, whether you are employed or not employed. Then we then have access to care and support services. Like I said, I said it's about 150 pages of questionnaire. It used to be 200, but it's now reduced to about 150 pages of a questionnaire. But the good thing is that it's done electronically. So they skip pattern. And so that kind of save us trouble. If, it doesn't, if things doesn't apply to a particular patient, it's skipped to another one that applies to him or her. Next slide. And so as part of MMP, we are required to make effort to link people that are out of care uh, into services that they might have need for. So this is just a representation of uh, the care linkage for MMP. And this is uh, at the national level, just to show uh, showcase some of the linkages that are being, that we actually do link patient to like HIV, case management, meal or, and so, this is uh, from what the CDC found out between 2018 to 2020, more than 8,500 people, MMP participants were offered information to connect them to the services that are listed above. In our own case, we work closely with HIV uh, prevention to, to, to offer linkage to any service that is needed by the patient. Next slide. Okay, so these are some of the MMP uh, re recruitment materials. There are a lot, a lot of them, but we just showcase a few of them. So that in, at times when you have a patient come by you, I, I receive an email or I receive a postcard. Do you know this? Do you know anything about this? I have no idea whether it's legitimate or not, or whether it's from the health department or not. So you can better uh, take note of some of these pictures. So we have a lot more, but these are the uh, postcard that we use to recruit the, it just kind of, indicate there that you've been invited to participate in a, a voluntary and confidential health survey that takes uh, uh, 45 to 60 minutes. And, and if you agree to participate, you at the end of the participation, you get $75 gift card as a token for, your, of, uh, for appreciation of your time spent. So we just wanted to showcase that in case any of the patient or you come across any of this, we have a lot more than this one, but this is just a few of them. 
So we try to mimic the periods, like when it's Halloween, when it's summer, when it's uh, Christmas or New Year, we have all kinds of cards that we do, the display and send to the patient. Next slide. Okay, talking about data, I just thought we should showcase some of the few data that MMP has been able to, uh, like I said, MMP is it's uh, where most things that has to do with HIV that folks rely on these days for data, at least at the national level and most time in the local levels too. So the example I have here was just met an unmet need that uh, this is a study that we did for, uh, I think it was presented last year in the TPHA conference. And so it, you can see here that uh, people that actually receive the service, this was about dental care services, there were about 50% of people that uh, requested for the dental care got the dental care and then 26% needed but they did not get. So these are the folks that needed uh, help with, uh, need, need to be referred. And then 24% uh, of them never actually needed any of this service. But in terms of national level, we could see that 21% of them needed dental care and then uh, this other 10% was SNAP service and housing. So in other words, 41% of all people with HIV needed, HIV needed but did not receive care at least one HIV or solar service. So this is just to show in terms of comparison that uh, we are doing well in Houston Harris County in terms of receiving the, the, the care itself from mental care. Next slide. Also, this is also one of the data uh, based on MMP data. On the right is actually Houston based data. 45% uh, of people living with diagnosed HIV in Houston are age 50 and above. And uh, on the right, same thing, this is at the national level. It says there that uh, of the over 1 million people living HIV in the United States, nearly half are over the age of 50. So it's kind of reflect what we have in Houston too, close to half. Next slide. So these are the kinds of things that you can get with MMP data. So here we have persons who needed receive or did not receive support services, a medical managing project. And so on the right is the United States as a whole, on the left is Houston specific data. Uh, of course, system specific data, when you look at it, it, it also sums up the, the, the 23 sites along with. So you can really look at it side by side and be able to see where we are doing well and where we are not doing well in terms of uh, getting the services that is needed. Again, the whole purpose of uh, sh showcasing this was just to give an idea of the kinds of things that uh, MMP data can produce and might be useful to some project or some program within the health department and even outside. Next slide. Again, this is the national level data. What is uh, internalized stigma? I was showing that nearly two out of three says that it's difficult to tell others about their HIV. And on the right hand side, almost eight in 10 patients in the United States report feeling internalized HIV related stigma. Next slide. And by the way, most of these are online there uh, and the CDC website too. I know we're trying to get our website back and running. So we'll have uh, some of this on there. And uh, continuing, uh, which group are most affected by internalized HIV? You can see here, generally it's, uh, it seems to be a uh, Latino followed by African-American and then the lung. And in terms of age, it also seems to be 30 to 39 years age are much more uh, affected by internalized HIV related stigma. And in terms of gender, there's almost closely, I'm sure there's no statistical difference, but you can see it from there that women seems to be more feeling it than men. And on the right is uh, your HIV patient among the one, one in three who have not been vaccinated. Again, that's, that's for hepatitis B. So that's another data point that we do have in MMP. Next slide. Okay, this is where it gets closer to home. So 
Uh, unfortunately, this is just an up sheet uh, presentation. Otherwise, if you were to kind of figure out things about uh, specific say, syphilis or gonorrhea, that would have been, we have the data itself. So here is the national data that uh, uh, showcases the percentage of sexually active adults with diagnosed HIV who tested for gonorrhea, syphilis, and uh, chlamydia the past 12 months. And this is based on 2022 data from, again, like I said, national, this is a national data. So for gonorrhea, it was 51, for chlamydia, it was 51, for syphilis it was 63 that got tested. And then for a combination of the three, it was 46.6. And the only closest one I had was a presentation that we gave, uh, I think two weeks ago in Detroit during the nature conference, it was the next slide. Yeah, I hope it's clear enough. This was a, a poster presentation that we had at the nature conference. Fortunately, it seems to be kind of related to, to this. So we were looking at people who are 50 years and above who diagnose HIV using the population-based analysis, uh, which is this MMP data. And from what we can see, the number is quite quite different from the national. Unfortunately, we can go back and forth. So about 40% of folks got tested for gonorrhea. It's on the right hand side. That's I'm just, and then 69% got tested for syphilis. I think that should be much higher than the national level. National level was 63, I believe. And then the other, the other one is lower than the national level. So that means less people get tested for gonorrhea here in Houston Harris County. And again, in terms of uh, chlamydia, they were just 39.9%, 30, which again is lower than the national level. And then in contrast, I guess for the three put together, we saw 43. Uh, Elon, can you go back one slide more? Yeah, we saw 46. So we saw 46 for the combination of uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Next slide. But in Houston Harris County, we are having 36% of the, th the three combinations. And they were, we observed no different. There was no statistical difference between what I say by race, gender, age group, or by age group. So there were no difference. The other unique thing that we found was uh, that receipt of uh, STI, which is a combination of this were significant associated with the subject education. So, so generally receipt of all these uh, tests were directly associated with the educational level, meaning that people who have higher education were more likely to test versus people who are not uh, highly educated. Next slide. So I guess right on time. So uh, in summary, so MMP allows for accurate estimate of met, unmet, and unneeded support services. So if we know that it, it service is not needed, we can always uh, repurpose that that money to something, some other service that might be in need. The estimate also allow for a better understanding of the continuum of care dynamics in Houston Harris County. Again, the MMP data can be used by round why we had said that uh, to prioritize and locate funds to fill gaps in medical care and HIV services, especially among marginalized population. MMP also can be used to highlight disparities in uh, care and services and also advocate for need resources, needed resources. And it could also help us uh, to plan our intervention at this year at the health department. Next slide. Yeah, I would like to acknowledge the Eastern Medical Monitoring Project staff for their hard work contribution in getting this data because without them, this data wouldn't uh, be in place. And then also a community advisory board and provider advisory board. They have been part and part of this uh, effort. And also are partnering uh, care facilities, the providers that allow us to be in their offices to conduct interviews and also to request medical record. And most importantly, the participant themselves. And again, our health department leadership and staff, they all because we work together. So yeah, encouragement and support also helps a lot. And our funders, which is the clinical outcome team at the Center for Disease Control, and of course our partner, Round White Planning Council and Office of Support. So thank you all. Next slide. I think show my address. 
Dr. Osaro, thank you so very much. And I know we are we are to the end of our hour and a half. Um, if there's any burning questions real quickly for Dr. Osaro, otherwise I can share contact information as well. And we'll make sure to get these slides out to everybody. Uh, so Elder, the last page has the contact information. So if you might want to kind of uh, switch to the next slide. Oh, I think I went the wrong way. You might have to do there it. There it goes. Time. Okay. Okay. Didn't okay. click far enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, sir. And I I know that was we yeah. introduced that one on short time. Yeah, I was hoping I wasn't raising because I was looking at time and trying to get it done. No, you did a yeah. wonderful, wonderful job. Yeah. So I'll throw it out there again. If there's any burning questions, feel free to come off mute or raise your hand. Otherwise, I think you did a great job explaining it. Thank you. Well, folks, as promised, uh, I will get slides out as quick as I can. Um, I do have to get our communications team to trim this just a little bit and we'll get it uploaded on the website. That usually takes a couple days, but I'll uh, send word out as soon as that's up. And thank you all for attending. I know there's a lot going on this week with school starting and all that, um, but uh, very much appreciate you taking the time and we'll keep you posted. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.